All right, so today we're going to take what we've been learning and we are going to apply that to what we kind of started yesterday was this idea of having congruent triangles, triangle congruence. And we're going to learn some different ways that we have to prove that triangles are congruent. So yesterday we said CPCTC, congruent parts, I'm um, sorry, corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So that means that we had to have all three sides and we had to have all three angles equal to each other to say that two triangles were congruent. So what I'm gonna show you today, and I'm gonna give you a couple more tomorrow, are some ways that you don't have to have every bit of information. You don't have to have every side and every angle in order to prove that triangles are congruent. So if all corresponding angles and sides of two triangles are congruent, then the triangles are congruent. That's exactly what we said um, yesterday. This piece right here, that is C, P, C, T. However, you can prove that triangles are congruent using fewer parts. So that's what we're gonna do right now. So we have a theorem in geometry that says side, 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 and we're gonna to abbreviate that SSS, that information is enough to show that triangles are congruent. So if you know that you have three sides of one triangle, congruent to three sides of another triangle, then those two triangles are congruent. So check it out. If AB is congruent to DE, I know that by the one tick mark, and I know that BC is congruent to EF, and I know that AC is congruent to DF. That is all I need to say that these two triangles are congruent. So then triangle ABC is congruent to triangle. I have to go in the same order. So if I did ABC, I have to go triangle DEF. Okay, that is my congruency statement. Remember, the order of your letters matter in a congruency statement. So I don't need to know anything about the angles of a triangle. All I need to have are three sides and three sides congruent to one another. And then that proves that those two triangles are congruent. So what I would like to take you through is called a proof. And a proof is a logical flow of statements and reasons. So we can claim that something is true, and then we're going to write the reason on why we know it's true. This is why definitions and theorems are so important, because they are the reasons that we are able to make the claims that we can. Definitions and theorems are fact, and facts are the reasons, okay, we can make the claims that we are making. So let me take you through your first proof. So a proof always has two parts to it. It has a given statement, so they are giving you this information, and it has a prove statement. The given is what you start with, the prove is what you end with. All right, so check it out. My given information is where I start. So that is right there. And I can mark it on my diagram and I should always mark up my diagram. So this says that PQ, PQ is congruent to ST. And the reason why I know that is because somebody gave it to me. So my reason is given. And then I move on. QR is congruent to RT. QR is congruent to RT. Let's mark it. QR 
is congruent to RT, label it with two marks. How did I know that those two were congruent to each other? Well, it was given to me in the problem. And then R is the midpoint of PS. R is the midpoint of PS. So how did I know that R is the midpoint of PS? Well, it was given to me as well. Now, I need to think about this statement. What does it mean to be a midpoint? This means that R is in the middle of PS. So here I'm looking at PS. R is in the exact middle of PS. R is exactly halfway between PS. What does that mean for PR and RS? If R is exactly halfway, doesn't it mean that PR is the exact same length as RS if R is exactly halfway in the middle? So, I can now say that PR is congruent to RS. That's what I just labeled on my diagram. Look at here. PR is congruent to RS. So this word right here led me to labeling and writing this statement. That word allowed me to make those marks and to make that statement. So what is the reason why I'm allowed to make this claim? Well, because we know the definition of midpoint. If you didn't know what a midpoint was, you would have no idea that that was exactly halfway between P and S. You would have no idea that those two distances are equal to each other. So knowing your definitions is important. Knowing your definition allows us to be able to move through a problem and to move on to the next step. Okay, so now the prove statement is always the last statement. What you are trying to prove is always your last statement. So I've arrived. I now have enough information to make the claim that triangle PQR is congruent to triangle STR. Looking at my diagram, what allows me to know and to say that those two triangles are congruent? Well, I've got one, two, three pairs of congruent sides, which means that I have side, 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 and that is my reason. Side, side, side allows me because it's a theorem, it allows me to make the claim that those two triangles are congruent. So that is your first proof. You are given statements, okay? That's where you start, those are what you write down. If it's given to you, your reason is simple, it is given to you. The last statement is always where you wanna end the proof, and that's with the proof. And as I'm marking up, I'm filling in the rest of my proof, to get me to the very, very, very last reason. All right, so let's take a look at number two. Number two says, given JL is congruent to MN. So JL is congruent to MN, that is given to us, and let's mark it on our diagram. JL is congruent to MN. All right, the next one. K is the midpoint of JN and LM. So here's number two. K is the midpoint of JN and LM, and I know that because it is given. Okay, how do I mark that on my diagram? Well, I need to know what that means. K is in the middle of JN. So that means if K is in the middle, then JK has the same length as KN. So that means I can mark those two equal to each other because that is the definition of midpoint. So look at JK led me to KN, 
being equal to each other. How did we know that? Because we knew the definition of midpoint. A proof is always going to logically flow. All right, now what? The K was also the midpoint of LM. So LM is this guy, K is in the exact middle, which means that K, um, sorry, LK and KM have to be the exact same distance. They are equal to each other. Notice that's my next statement. LK congruent to KM. How did I know that? How was I able to mark those as congruent? Well, it goes back to knowing the definition of midpoint. Now we are to the end. We now have enough information to prove that triangle JKL is congruent to triangle NKM. What is the information here that I've labeled in my diagram? What is that telling me? Why do I know that these two triangles are congruent? Because we have one, two, three sides congruent. That means that we have side, side, side congruency. That is the reason why I can say the two triangles are congruent to each other. All right, so let's try one where we've got to fill in everything on our own. So this looks scarier, but it's really not. So check it out. I'm going to write my givens. So the first given is that AC is congruent to AD. And the second one is that CB is congruent to BD. And those are given. I also know that I'm supposed to end with my prove statement which means I can come down here to the end, number four, and fill in triangle ABC. We're gonna wanna show that that is congruent to triangle ABD. So this looked scary, right? There were eight things for us to fill in, but we're already more than halfway there. We have five boxes filled in already, and all we had to do was fill in eight. Good stuff, right? All right, so every proof, I'm gonna start with my givens, and then my last line is where I want to end. All right, now let's go and figure this out. So I'm gonna go back to my given and I'm gonna mark this on my diagram. Okay, it's easier when you can see it labeled on your diagram. So AC is congruent to AD. So we'll mark that, that was given. CD is congruent to BD. So I've marked that, it was given. And now what? Well, I wanna point out something to you here. Do you see in this triangle, AB is a side length? And do you see here in this triangle that AB is also a side length? These two triangles share this side, okay, they have it in common, they share that side. That means that if I'm looking at AB for the top triangle, it has to be equal to AB on the bottom triangle, right? It's the same line, it has to be congruent. If I took a ruler and I measured from A to B using the top triangle, and then I took a ruler and I measured AB on the bottom triangle, it would be the exact same length. It's the same line. Now this is called something in mathematics. When you have AB congruent to AB or um, like angle A congruent to angle A, that is called the reflexive property. Back a long time ago, when you were learning the commutative property and the associative property and the reflexive property, okay, you learned that. If the same thing is equal to the same thing, that is called the reflexive property. Okay, so now I can mark that AB and AB are congruent to each other. And now I'm at the end of my proof. What is going to allow me to say that these two triangles are congruent to each other? Well, 
I've got one, two, three sides. I've got the same one, two, three sides. So that is going to be side, side, side congruency. So side, side, side congruency is just one of the couple of ways that we can prove triangles are congruent. The other way that we're gonna learn today is called side angle side. Now this is very specific. It means that you have two sides that are congruent to each other and the angle has to be in between those two sides. So do you see how I have my two sides and where those two sides meet? That is the angle in between those two sides. So as I go around the corner, it would go side, angle, side. Go around the corner, side, angle, side. So if, let's write it out, side length AB is congruent to side length DE, Angle B is congruent to angle E. And then side length BC is congruent to side length EF. Then that is enough to say side angle side, these two triangles are congruent to one another. So that means that triangle ABC is congruent to, go in the same order, triangle D E F. So the side in, I'm sorry, the angle included means that the angle has to be between the sides. Okay. That's very, very, very important. So let's go through a proof. So I'm going to start with my given and I'm going to end with my proof. So the given says that J M is congruent to NL. Here's the first statement. How do I know? It's given, and let me mark it. JM is congruent to NL. All right, the second given says that angle JMN is congruent to angle LNM, and that is given. All right, how do I mark that? Well, the angle is always the middle letter. So angle JMN is this angle right here. And LNM, okay, it's the middle letter. So that refers to this angle right here. So I've got a side and I have an angle. So do you see what I see? Do you see how you have a triangle here and a triangle here and holy smokes, they share this entire side length. That means that MN is congruent to MN. How do I know that? What's that property called? MN congruent to MN? That is the reflexive property. And now I have enough information. It helps if you block off a triangle at a time and look at the triangle. So I have side, angle, side. See how they're right in a row like that? Side, angle, side. And then in my other triangle, I've got the same thing, side, angle, side. So side, angle, side is enough for me to claim or prove that the triangles are congruent. Side, angle, side is your reason. These are mathematical theorems that have already been proven by mathematicians. And if it's already been proven, then we can use it as our own reason. All right, let's take a look at number five. So I've got AB is congruent to BC. So that was given to me. I also know that BD bisects angle a, B, C, and that is given to me. And then our proof statement is down here at the end. There's our proof statement. Okay, so now let's go ahead and mark up our diagram. It says that A, B is congruent to B, C. 
And then how do I label this? It says that BD bisects angle ABC. So this is angle ABC, A, B, C. BD, this line right here, bisects that angle. What does it mean to bisect something? It means to cut in half. It means that you have two equal angles. Holy smokes, guess what? I can now mark this little angle, ABD, congruent to this little angle, CBD. And that's what that says right there. Those two angles are congruent to one another. Well, how did I know that? How did I know that I was able to have two equal angles? It's because we knew what? We knew the definition of bisects, or in geometry, we would call it a bisector. We knew what the definition of bisector or bisects was. That's how I knew that I was cutting something in half and that I was getting two equal pieces. Okay, so I need three things. I either need a side, side, and a side, or I need a side, angle, and a side. We only have two things. We have one side and we have one angle. Do you see where that second side is coming from? Look at the top triangle, look at the bottom triangle. Do you see that DB is shared between the two? So I can say that DB or BD, whatever order you want, they are equal to each other. DB uh, or BD congruent to each other. What is that called when the same thing is, whoops, sorry, is equal to the same thing? That is called the reflexive property. All right, go one triangle at a time. What do you see? Side, angle, side side, angle, side. So these two triangles are congruent because of side, angle, side. All right, let's do another one together. So I've got my given, V is the midpoint of WZ and XY. So there's my first statement. So this is given. And that's it. That's all I've got. So I have way more to fill in on this one. All right, how do we do that? Well, we need to start making our marks. So it says that V is the middle of WZ. What does that mean if V is the middle? It means that WV and BZ are the same length. They are congruent to each other. So why was I able to make those marks? Why was I able to say that WV was congruent to ZV? It's because, what do we know? We know the definition of midpoint. Right there, we knew what that meant. All right, let's keep going. V is also the midpoint of XY. So here's XY. And V is the middle of that. Well, what does that do? That creates two congruent sides. So now we have an XV congruent to a VY. Um, it's right here in number four. So what allows me to be able to say that in number four? Because we knew the definition of midpoint. Now some of you right now are saying, um, how do we just skip a line? Well, there's going to be some things in the middle of a proof that don't have to be in a particular order. Like it didn't matter if I said that this one was number two and number two was actually number four, or I could have flip-flopped three and four. The order of those things doesn't matter because I didn't need one to be able to prove another. They are all independent of each other. So those independent pieces can come in any order. It does not matter. Okay, so 
let's take a look at this angle. Angle W V X W V X. So this angle right here is congruent to Y V Z this angle right there. Oh, that looks familiar, right? I've got an X marked and I have angles that are opposite in that X. I told you vocabulary was important. Why am I able to say that those two angles are equal to each other? What kind of angle pair is that? Do you remember? Those are vertical angles. And I know from the beginning of this unit that vertical angles are congruent. That's what allows me to say that because I know what vertical angles are. I know that they are congruent. So now I've got enough information to prove that my triangles are congruent. Go one triangle at a time. What do you see? Side, angle, side. Side, angle, side. So side, angle, side is my reason. So all these reasons, definition of bisector, definition of midpoint vertical angles, these are very, very common reasons that we are going to be using over and over and over again. Feel free to be on the lookout for those things to be occurring. We use them a lot. All right, let's do number seven together. All right, number seven says, HI is congruent to GJ right here. How do I know? given. It also says that HI is, what does that mean? Parallel to GJ. And that is given. Okay, that's all we know. Let's mark it. HI is congruent to GJ. How do I mark on my diagram that these two lines are parallel to one another? Well, we have to do our little triangles to show that they are parallel to one another. All right, looking at our diagram, what else do you see? I see a triangle here and I see a triangle here and they are sharing this side length. So doesn't that mean that HJ is congruent to HJ. Do you see that in the proof? It's right here, number four. What allows me to say HJ is congruent to HJ? That is the reflexive property. So I have two side pairs. I either need a third side pair or I need an angle. So let's go back to those parallel lines. So those parallel lines are right here and here. They are being cut by this transversal giving me this angle congruent to this angle. And that's what we have listed here. Angle GJH is congruent to IHJ. Now, kiddos, let me pause here for a moment before we do this reason. If you have multiple angles at a corner, I am not allowed to call this angle, angle J, because is angle J referring to that one, or is angle J referring to that one? I don't know. If you have more than one angle, you have to call the angle by its three letters. Angle G, I would just be able to call angle G because there's only that one angle there. It's obvious on which one angle G is or which one angle I is. But J and K, I'm sorry, J and H have a lot going on. You have to label them with their three letters. So if you want to say angle J, then J has to be the middle letter in the three letters. If you want to say angle H, then H has to be the middle letter of those three letters. Okay, back to parallel lines. What kind of angle pair is it when you have parallel lines? So these angles are inside, so they are interior, 
and they are on opposite sides of the transversal. Do you remember what those are called? Alternate interior angles. We know that alternate interior angles are congruent, which allows me to mark them as congruent. All right, now we have enough. I can look at one triangle at a time. What do we have? Side, angle, side. Look at this triangle, side, angle, side. So that confirms it. We have congruency because of side, angle, side. Okie doke. So now let's jumble them up. Instead of looking at them separately, let's look at them together and figure out what it is we have. So it says state whether the triangles could be proven congruent, if possible by side, 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 or by side, angle, side, and then write the congruency statement. So we look at one triangle at a time. What does that look like? Side, angle, side. How about this one? Side, angle, side. So side angle side is what we can use to show congruent and now i need to write a congruency statement so you pick the order you want to start so i'll just call this t q y and then you have to match up the pieces so the first triangle is always easy to name and then you have to be careful about how you name the second one so do you see that angle T has two lines and no line? Angle P has two lines and no line. So angle P goes together. Um, Q is the obtuse angle. C is the obtuse angle. So those go together. And then Y has a mark, K has a mark. So Y and K have to go with one another. So decide on how you want to name the first triangle and then go slow and make sure your second triangle matches. All right, let's look at number two. So when I look at one triangle at a time, I have side, side. Well, that's not enough. And I have side, side, that's not enough. Do you see what I see? Do you see that AC is equal to AC because of the reflexive property? Now, what do we have? Side, 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 side. So this is side, side, side congruency. And we have to do our triangles. Um, I'm just gonna go, let's say D, A, C. So D is all by itself. That goes with B all by itself. A is in between one and two lines. So, I'm sorry, one and three lines. C is in between one and three lines. And then C is in between two and three lines, which goes with A, which is in between two and three lines. So I'm kind of looking for landmarks, like where are things located? What are some identifying markers that things are lying in between so that I can get my letters in the correct order? All right, number three is tricky. Number three is tricky because you have two triangles that are overlapping each other. Let me highlight them for you. Here's one triangle, and then I'm gonna just outline it. Here's the other triangle. So those triangles are overlapping each other. Because they are overlapping each other, do you see how MK for the yellow triangle is the same as MK for the green triangle? That means, we can use the reflexive property to say that they are equal to each other. All right, one triangle at a time, what do you got? Green triangle says side, angle, side. Yellow triangle says side, angle, side. So this has to be a side, angle, side congruency. And now I'm gonna label it, let's just say um, J, M, K is congruent to, well, J goes with L, 
and then I went straight down. So that means that M goes with K, and then I went across M. So when you have overlapping triangles like that, it can be tricky to see. A use of a highlighter is very, very, very important. All right, let's see number four. So I'm gonna look at one at a time. I see two sides in an angle, but what's the problem with that angle? It's in the wrong spot, right? If I have side angle side, wouldn't it have to be side angle side? This angle is not in between those two sides. So that is set up incorrectly for our side angle side. Let's look here. Same thing, right? If it's side angle side, I would need that angle. So this is not our side angle side. I don't have side side side. So that means that these two triangles are not congruent. All right, there's no, are you ready for it? Angle side side. There's no ass and there's no ass backwards, side side angle. So that's the only time that you're gonna hear me swear. This is actually my favorite lesson to do and I have an administrator in here. <laughs> uh, don't swear at me guys. Do not use ASS or SSA as a reason for your triangles being congruent. You are not allowed to swear or write down a swear word at your teacher. That is bad news bears. That does not prove triangles are congruent and you are not allowed to use that as a reason. So if you find yourself swearing or you find yourself swearing backwards, then you don't have congruent triangles. And then you need to scribble that out or you don't need to write it at all. Okay, next one. What do you see? Do you see EF congruent to EF right here down the middle reflexive property? Ben, what do you see? One triangle at a time. Side, side, side. Side, side, side. So we've got side, side, side. And now congruency statement. How about CEF? And that's gonna match up with DEF. Look at number six. Number six, do you see those little triangles right there? Mm, those little triangles mean that you have parallel lines and those parallel lines are getting cut by a transversal, making these two angles congruent to one another. What kind of angles are those? Those are alternate interior angles. They are congruent. Now look at your triangle, what do you got? Side, angle, side, side, angle, side. So this is a side, angle, side. Um, how about J, D, A? So J would match up with M. D has one arc, so E has one arc, and then A is in the middle. All right, try number seven on your own. Look at one triangle at a time and tell me what you think. Did you see ASS, angle side side? Because that's what that is. Are you allowed to use angle side side? Or are you all allowed to use ass backwards, side side angle? Uh, nope, no you are not. So what does that mean? It means that they are not congruent. You are not allowed to swear. You are not allowed to swear backwards. All right, how about number eight? Try it on your own. What do you see? You see this X right here? Do you see these vertical angles being congruent to each other? Ah. Now what? Side angle side, side angle side. This is a side angle side. How about A, B, C congruent to, A is gonna go with E, 
B is going to go with D, and then C goes with C. Okay, so what we're doing is we're training your eyes to look for things, to look for reflexive, to look for vertical angles. When you have parallel lines, we're looking for those alternate interior or perhaps alternate exterior angles. We're training our eyes to see side, 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 or side, angle, side. All right, so these last proofs here, they are mixed up. So I'm either going to be using side, 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 or side, angle, side. I don't know until I go through these entire proofs. All right, so how do we fill it out? Well, we start with our given. So the first given is that AB is congruent to CD given. Our second one is that AB is parallel to CD given. Our last one is that D is the midpoint of BE given. And then our proof statement is always our last statement. So triangle ABD is congruent to triangle CDE. So I had 12 spots that I needed to fill in. I haven't even done any math yet. I just copied stuff down, right? And I only have five more boxes to fill in. So we are more than halfway there at this point. Okay, so now what? Now I label AB congruent to CD. AB parallel to CD. So we're probably going to be using those parallel lines. And then D is the midpoint or the middle of BE. So D is in the middle, which allows me to say that BD is congruent to DE. How was I able to make that jump? How did I go from D being a midpoint to saying that those two were congruent to each other? It's because I knew the definition of midpoint. Oops, mid point. All right, we don't have enough yet. Look at your triangles. I only have a side side. So that means that I'm gonna have to use these parallel lines for something. So check it out. I've got parallel lines here and I have my transversal right here. What does that do for this angle and this angle? It makes them equal to each other. Can I call that angle B? Yep, because it's all by itself. Angle B is congruent to, can I call that angle D? And that is a no. I've got lots of angles. I actually have three angles happening here. So angle, let's call it CDE. Those are congruent to each other because why? What kind of angle pairing is that? I'll give you a clue. They're both to the right of the parallel line and they're both above the transversal. So they have the same position. What is that to have the same position? That means that they are corresponding angles. That's what that means. All right, do you have enough now? Side, angle, side, side, angle, side. So this is side, angle, side. Proofs aren't bad when you get used to the flow. So there is a procedure, I think that you can see it by now that I'm following. I always do my givens, I always go to my proof, I always label things and I allow the statement to lead me to the next thing. So I'm using the information from above to fill out information below. All right, try this one on your own. This is a good one for you to pause and to work through ahead of me. So first one, KM is congruent to NM given. 
Second one, LK is congruent to LN given. And my proof statement, triangle LKM is congruent to triangle LNM. All right, everybody should have gotten that far, everybody. Label it, KM congruent to NM. LK congruent to LN, that's all the given. So did you see what comes next? Did your eyeball go to that? LM for the left is the same as LM for the right. So that means that LM is congruent to LM and that is because of the reflexive property. All right, now we're at the end. We can say our triangles are congruent. Why? Because we have side, 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 side. So it is confirmed side, side, side. Hopefully you did that one on your own. That was a good one to do on your own. Uh, number 11, also good to do on your own. Go ahead and pause me and fill out the proof. So we've got AD congruent to AB given. We've got AC bisects angle DAB given. And we have our proof ABC congruent to ABC. Okie dokie. AD congruent to AB. Oh, look at that. How nice. Somebody already labeled that for us. AC bisects D A B. So that means that AC, this line right here, is cutting in half this pink angle. If I cut something perfectly in half, don't I get two equal angles? Sure do. Let me write those down. I can't call it angle A because there's two of them. So I have to call it by its three letters. So DAC is congruent to angle BAC. It was angle A, those are my middle letters. And what allowed me to know that I had two equal angles? It's because of this word right here. We knew that word. We knew the definition of bisector or you could write definition of bisects. All right, go back to your diagram. What else do you see on here? I hope you're getting quick and catching it. Did you see down the middle, AC is congruent to AC? What allows me to say AC congruent to AC? That's the reflexive property. Do we have enough to say triangles are congruent? What do you got? Side, angle, side, side, angle, side, side, angle, side. So we're just doing a little piece at a time, a little piece at a time, allowing one statement and reason to flow into the next statement and reason. All right, you can do this one on your own too. Pause it. JM congruent to MN given. L is the midpoint of JN given. And then prove that triangle JLM is congruent to triangle LNM. Everybody should be able to do that without me. Everybody should be able to label their triangles without me. So JM congruent to MN. It says that L is the midpoint or the middle of JN. If L is in the middle, what does that mean? It means that we have two equal pieces. JL is congruent to LN. 
what allowed me to know because that L was in the middle that those two were equal to each other because we know the definition of midpoint. All right, I don't have enough info yet. I've got side side. That's not enough. What else do you see? You see that right there? Right down the middle, LM congruent to LM. That is the reflexive property. And side, 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 side. So we have side, side, side. Okie doke. So the very back of this page is just going to be all of the different ways that we are able to prove triangles are congruent. So right now, we only know side, 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 and side, angle, side. So we know side, side, side is one way to prove triangles are congruent. And we know side, angle, side. So as we go through the next couple of days, then we will be adding here onto this page as we get more and more ways to prove. So you already know what is up ahead, okay? We're just gonna practice these two for right now. So that leads me to uh, moving on to your practice and I will see you tomorrow. Don't forget, if you've got questions, if you need help with something, then um, come into a Google Meet or send me an email, um, or I will see you in class. Okay, have a good one.